speaker. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce Peter Shulman to you. Now, Peter comes from Sweden. He is a professional genetic genealogist at the company DNA Academy, providing training, presentations, and consultancy for genealogists. He's also an author, having written a handbook on genetic genealogy and a popular science book on the peopling of Sweden spanning the last 11,000 years. He's also a regular contributor to various Swedish genealogy magazines. And today, uh, Peter is going to focus on mitochondrial DNA, which is not something that certainly we use a lot in our genealogy, and Peter would contend that we're not using it enough. So to tell us all about the hidden power of mitochondrial DNA, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Peter Scholl. Thank you. Thank you for having me back this year. Yeah, I was talking about Viking DNA last year. It might be uh, a Viking or two in this also. Yeah. Um, just a quick update about genetic genealogy in Sweden. Because when I was here a year ago, there were 20,000 people tested in Sweden. Now, the latest figure is 40,000 in a year. <laughs> it's really skyrocketing in Scandinavia. And I wonder if you all realize how much information you are carrying around all day. Do you know how much information you have in your DNA? If you were to put the information that you have is one gram on DNA, that's so little you can't even see. But you take that information and put it on CD records. You know, a CD can carry an hour of music or a half an hour of video. It's a lot of information. But how many CDs do you think you would need to, uh, to record the data in one gram of DNA? Can you guess this? A lot. Yeah, that's true. Very, very large lot. Because just to carry the information of one gram of DNA, you need 1,000 billion CDs. That's amazing, isn't it? So you're carrying in family history books, all of you, all the time, without really thinking about it. And all this information, it's hard to know how much is 1,000 billion CDs. It's larger than the record collections of the most of us. But um, to give you another example, in Sweden we have photographs, all church records of the whole country. And in Sweden we have records back to the 16th century. And all those books, every page, photographs in color, you can fit that into one gram of DNA. One million times. That gives you a perspective. But today I'm going to speak about a very tiny piece of DNA. Mitochondrial DNA. It's a very, very tiny piece of your DNA, consisting of, about, of only 16,500 letters, DNA letters. But it's very useful if you know how to use it. Because you know where it comes from. It always comes from your mother, and her mother, and her mother. Autosomal DNA can come from anywhere. But mitochondrial DNA it always comes from the mother line. That's great, because I heard yesterday, and we can see online, people saying, ah, mitochondrial DNA, that's useless, not for genealogy, academic interest, maybe, thousands of years ago. Is that right? But actually, because it goes that way, you can use it if you really know how to use it. And uh, many of you have big trees, your computers, I suppose, your databases, and when you have researched your family tree for a couple of years, you're getting a lot of people and a lot of places in your tree that could be wrong. Is that right? You're beginning to wonder, okay, are all those family connections correct? It's hard to know. Records can be wrong. You can interpret them wrong. But uh, I'm going to give you an example with my wife's grandmother. City in the new one song. She was born in the beginning of the 1900s. And I have traced her maternal ancestry back through the church records, court records, tax records, etc., all the way back to the beginning of the 17th century. There are good records in Sweden. It's hard to trace women 
in the 17th century, even in Sweden, because they are not always mentioned in the records. But this is pretty far back, isn't it? And in this case, I also know that this is correct. I know that this whole line of mothers, that's the correct family. And how do I know that? Well, because of the mitochondria DNA. When my wife tested, she got the result, and uh, she was quite alone with that result in, uh, in the Nordic countries. There was no one else who had the same mitochondria DNA at the group. That was quite disappointing. Okay, what should we use this for? But anyway, my wife carries the same mitochondria DNA as all those mothers. And after a year or two, I started to pop up matches all around Sweden with the same haptic group. I contacted those people and we started to trace their mother line up further back. And it turned out they all merged into one area in northern Sweden. All had their mother lines from the same area. And when we traced them a couple of generations more back, they actually merged in one woman. Sashkindil's daughter, who is the great, 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 great grandmother of my wife. So all these family lines, we didn't know it about each other before they tested, but they turned out we had the same, and we went into the records, and we could connect them all in this giant family tree of only women, all the way back to 16 of 1610. And this is, right now, the largest tree, at least in the Nordic countries that is verified with DNA and all with women all its way back to the beginning of the 17th century. And it gives me great pleasure to tell my kids who are here that I, with 100% certainty, I know who their great, 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 great grandmother is. Isn't that great? Great, yeah. So, if you connect with people and research, try to go back as far as you can in their trees. You can find connections. Not always, but you can. In this case, one of those people had a brick wall. The man in the beginning of the 18th century over there, he had two wives with the same name, Karin Andersdotter. And it was impossible to see in the church records who was the mother of this child. In this case, because she matched it, all those people, she was able to determine, okay, this is, it's that cardinal that got there, because she matches the tree. So you can go through brick walls even with mitochondria DNA. The haplogroup is H52, and if you look under haplogroups, how many have taken a mitochondria DNA test? Oh, oh, great, many of you. And you know you have something called extra mutations. Extra mutations, that's branches not yet specified under this haplogroup. And people with the same extra mutations are found in the same area up in northern Sweden. The big dot is Kerstin Nils Dotter, the one we know of. The other ones, we can't connect in the records. They must connect before written sources. We know that they are related somehow. And based on the extra mutations, we can see how the family tree looks beyond the written sources. When we hear people saying that, okay, mitochondria DNA, well, could be fun, but of no use when it comes to genealogy, because you have no real matches. Right? Many of you say, oh, I have matches maybe two, three, four, five, six thousand years ago. That's not, not that interesting. I, I was lucky when I got all those matches of my wife's haptic group, of course. But the key to use mitochondria DNA, that is target testing. To find the right people to test. Not just take your test, wait for matches. That's not always uh, so... You don't get so much out of that. 
But if you test yourself and then you find other people to target test, then you can really use mitochondrial DNA. <coughs> Like this, if you test your mother's line or your father's one's line and you trace that as far back as you can in the records, then the key is not to sit around and wait for matches. Go get them. Find another line from your great 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 great, great grandmother as far as back in the world. Find another daughter and trace a line up to living people. And that living person could be a man or a woman because even we inherit this from our mothers but we can't pass it on to our children. You do this, trace your own lines and then you trace another line up to living people and you contact them and test them. Then you can verify that these lines are correct in your family tree. Imagine if you test a couple of lines and all genealogists do the same then several lines in your family tree will be tested by someone else. You can tap into their verified lines. And imagine if you also count all the Y chromosome lines, all the male paternal lines that people test. In a couple of years, you'll have a huge network of DNA verified family lines all over Europe and the world. And that will really benefit all genealogists. We know that these family lines are true. So, so keep testing your lines and, and target testing possible relatives. Another thing that's really interesting with mitochondrial DNA and one by DNA is that you can take a historical person. In this case we have started with uh, Margareta Hans, Dr. Sedro Fynsia. This was a famous woman born in the late 1500s in Sweden. She was called the great mother of Dalakarlia. Dalakarlia is a region in Sweden. And um, she was very, very much things written about her. She was well known in this region 500 years ago. And why was she called the great mother? Well, she had 11 children, or two more that died, with her husband, who was a vicar. And uh, his husband, her husband actually had seven more children from his former marriage. So she had to raise 18 children. That's quite a lot. And hence, she got the name the Great Mother of Dalakalia. She was the vicar's wife in that region that really stood out and had to care take care of so many, many children. And this is the interesting, this is an interesting woman, and she had five daughters of her own. And that made us think, hmm, it would be very interesting to see if you can trace living descendants through only female lines up until today, to see if we can get her DNA. So we actually, it started, researching two of these daughters. It's a tough work, going 500 years, only women, no man has to be anywhere. It's like it stops with men, and you have to start, it, start over. But we managed, actually, to find two lines up onto living people. And it turned out it, it was two men, because they had no sisters, but it doesn't matter in this case. Those two men, in the Gothenburg and in mid-Sweden. They, according to the records, they should be female descendants of Margareta, the great mother of Dalekarlia. So it was very interesting to wait for the results, because if all this was correct, they should have the same mitochondria DNA. And they had. That's great. You know that all these long lines back to the late 1500s are correct. And we also know that their mitochondrial DNA is the same as her mitochondrial DNA. So now we have her mitochondrial DNA and we're starting to trace her roots back. Because she has matches and they have matches. So we can 
hopefully try to find out where she came from. So, this is really genealogy, isn't it? It's mitochondria DNA. This would be impossible, they say, on the internet. Is that true? But if you use it like this, if you start with your own family and you trace it to living people, test them, you can verify your own family tree, or you can take historical persons, trace it to living people, there's a lot of genealogy in this, to find all these lines, then you can also use mitochondria DNA to verify lines and get the DNA of historical people. That is the way, I think, the best you use mitochondria DNA when it comes to genealogy. But the fascinating thing about mitochondria DNA and wine DNA is you cannot go just five generations, you can do 15 generations, you can do 50 generations, you can do 100 generations back through time with the help of mitochondria DNA. <coughs> And uh, I'm going to give you an example. <coughs> we have, I have a friend in the world Sweden that when she tested, she got a mitochondria DNA haplogroup group that is totally unique in Europe. She's the one person in Europe who has this one. <coughs> C41C4A1C. And of course she wondered, how can I be so unique? I'm only from Sweden. Uh, so we have to trace, we traced her maternal line as far back as we could. And we ended up in 1650-ish, where Margareta Björnsdotter, that's the, the earliest woman in her maternal line that we could find in northern Sweden. But still, how could this woman in the mid-1600s carry this unique happy look? She had no idea until a year ago, when it turned out we got hold of a Russian research report, an article, that it had tested a lot of native people in northern Russia. And they had found one area where there was a lot of this C4A1C. Here, in eastern Siberia, there we have a lot of people with this exact haplogroup among the events. The events is the people living up there, reindeer herding and, and hunting for thousands of years. Beautiful dresses, isn't it? So, here DNA shows us that somehow one woman must have come from eastern Siberia, 850 kilometers to northern Sweden before the year 1600. Somehow. We don't know how, but it's quite intriguing. It could be, of course, that they had migrated over many, many, many generations, of course. But then we should see some traces along the way. We don't do that. Of course, everyone isn't tested yet, but still. So we have two theories. One is that we have those people that are uh, Vikings. You know the first Viking? The Vikings were up here in Murmansk, in northern Russia. And of course, it's quite easy to imagine they went a little bit further. It was very warm in the Viking Age, but there was no ice up there. So they could have gotten a bit more to the east and taken a woman oh, with them. That's one explanation. There is another possibility. Because nowadays, you know, we DNA test everything. They DNA test wheat to see where the first wheat were grown. They DNA they test snails to trace people's movement along the Atlantic coast. They DNA test everything. And also, reindeers. You know, in northern Scandinavia, we have reindeers. And the Sami people have been herding reindeers for a long time. But our reindeers, they don't come from northern Scandinavia. DNA tests has shown, that's a, that's a family tree for reindeers also. So the DNA test has shown that they come from northern Siberia. And they came to Scandinavia 1500 years ago. Not that long ago. It could be that this woman came along when we imported reindeer herding. Maybe she was a 
reindeer herding consultant <laughs> all that time. We don't know. One of those two could be right. We have to wait for more results. But this is also, also the, the um, exciting things about mitochondrial DNA. You don't get all the results directly. You have to wait for new results and untangle these, these riddles. And normally, when you're doing genealogy, you're looking at the closest family, or second, third, fourth, fifth cousins. But all those people that came before us, I think that as interesting as the, the nearest family, actually. And mitochondria DNA gives us the possibility, through all those tested remains, to go far back. Yesterday, you could see how they drilled into bones and got DNA from old remains. And the best thing about mitochondria DNA is that it's quite easy to get from old remains. It's easier than the other DNA. So all the findings they have done, they have almost every skeleton has their mitochondria DNA analyzed. This is how it looks now. All these markings, that's prehistoric individuals that has had their DNA analyzed. And when you take your own mitochondrial DNA test, you can compare and find who of these people are your distant prehistoric relatives. And you can also not only just find who, who are your relatives, you can also find, okay, how did my relatives live? Because when the archaeologists find these people, they find them in a context. So they can see what culture did they belong to, how did they live, what tools did they use. And all this information is available. I'm going to show an example of uh, a customer I helped who has his earliest known maternal ancestor in southern Sweden, in Skåne. And he said to me, okay, I want to know everything. How did they get there? How did my grand great 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 grandmother get there? We started to look back in time with all the data available and could trace that this maternal line had come from, from West Asia through the Middle East and this way through the millennia up to southern Scandinavia. And how do we do that? Well, we could actually find quite a lot of his prehistoric relatives. All these people, all these skeletons, turned out to have his mitochondrial DNA. But they are related to his maternal line. Maybe not the straight line, but they are have a common maternal ancestor with him. And you see, they started out between 10,000 and 30,000 years in the Middle East, West Asia, and then moved out through Europe, and eventually landed in Scandinavia. And if we look at this from the present time and go back, you can see that he's related to a couple of people, skeletons from the Viking Age in Denmark. And that is not very surprising. We have your roots in southern Sweden, of course, you are related to Vikings in Denmark. But going further back, we are 4,500 years back in what is now mid-Germany. There he had a couple of relatives that belonged to the corded ware culture. They are called that because their pottery was... The, uh, the patterns was made with, with the cords around the, the pottery. And these people, they were the first, as we heard yesterday also, the first to ride the horse, and the first to actually travel with chariots and move around a lot. And they also were the first people in the world to speak in the European languages. And I wonder, I mean, you speak a Celtic language, isn't it? Yeah, or an Anglo-Saxon language. And we speak a Germanic language. There are Roman languages, there are Slavic languages. But um, how many of you know how the Indo-European language sounded before it became Germanic, Celtic, etc.? Want to hear it? That's actually researchers in Sweden at Uppsala University that has traced the roots of all the European languages back to the, 
the uh, first in Indo-European language. And we will hear the researcher Jenny Larson from Uppsala read out a bit with um, how it must have sounded before the languages divided into our different families. something like that here. If you go further back in time on, on his maternal line, we find that he had prehistoric relatives here in what is now Ukraine so 6,000 years ago. And 6,000 years, well, when I started out with this a couple of years ago, 6,000 years, that's a lot. They were living in caves, right? That's the first thing you start thinking of, Stone Age, caves, long time ago. Maybe small huts in small settlements. But these people, they belonged to something called the Trapilia culture. And they had excavated a couple of settlements here in Ukraine that are huge. And more than 2,000 houses in those settlements. It's almost cities. 6,000 years ago. I think that's quite impressive. I didn't know that before I started with this. So people were advanced more than them. If you go even further, then we are 7,000 years back in what is now a former Yugoslavia, you could say Balkan. There we have people in the Stadtsevo culture that apparently are quite advanced too. They have found those small amulets with writing signs and the numbers on them. This is 7,000 years ago. That's before the Sumeric people. And in our school books in Sweden, it says that Sumerian people, that's what the first people that used writing. But apparently, no, these were before that. So you learn a lot about history when you're tracing your deep roots in mitochondrial DNA. But the most fascinating part was the earliest found prehistoric relative that I found for him. It's this man. He lived in a small village in northern Turkey 8,300 years ago. This village had been excavating it for more than 10 years, layer after layer after layer after layer. Really huge excavation project. Now they are down on the level that was the village in 8,300 years ago, the same time as he lived there. And on that level, they have found a floor a clay floor from a house, and it's hard, it, it's burnt, so probably this, the house burned down. In that floor, they have found two footprints. Imagine, a small village, the same time he, his maternal ancestor lived there, they found two footprints on the floor. It's not sure that it's his relative who walked there, but probably a close neighbor or something. I think that really brings the family together over the millennia. I mean, 8,000 years ago. Not, not that much. So he and his wife is going to go down to Turkey. They are preserved on a the, on the museum there in Turkey. So they, they're going to go down and maybe step in them to see if they're fit or something. <laughs> it really brings history to life. All thanks to DNA. You know, you have seen this probably, 
there is a family tree for all men in the world, and there is also a family tree for all the mothers in the world through mitochondria DNA. And all those branches, they are mapped by academics. Those main branches. These are the branches that are most common on Ireland. Anyone got something else? No, but you'll get them. And this tree, as long as there were <coughs> academics that did the findings and developed the tree, didn't happen much. But since genealogy is all over the world, and other people have tested their DNA, the tree is starting to look like this. It's exploding. It's just like the SNP tsunami we heard of. This is the mitochondria DNA tsunami. They're discovering new branches all the time. And academics haven't got a chance to, to do this. Now it's the genealogists of the world that are developing this tree. And if you have done your mitochondria DNA test, you can help develop this tree by submitting your DNA result to GenBank. How many have done that? Two, three. Okay, you have a lot to do when you come home. Because this database is a large research database of the US, Japan and Europe together. And here they collect data, not only from humans, they have mitochondria DNA or chimpanzees or fungi or whatever, so you can, you can compare yourself to a fungi, or a bacteria. It's a bit complicated to submit your result because it's a research database. But if you go to this link, then there's a fairly easy form to fill in and, and description on how you do it. It's a man called Ian Logan that has made this easier submission form. What you do is you go to your family, family tree DNA page, you go to your mitochondria DNA results, and there's a possibility to download your FASTA file, FASTA file, FASTA file. Uh, and then you submit that to the Android. So please do that to help build the tree. It looks like this if you look in the database. So it's nothing to use in your ordinary work. Uh, it's more for project administrators and researchers. But you're helping to find new branches. So hopefully, by people submitting to GenBank, we can get the, the tree growing even faster. I started with these quotes, and I'd say, let's throw them out and use this instead. It's a great genealogy tool, but you have to learn to use it, right? So go home and trace your lines to verify your tree with mitochondria DNA. And I just have to, oh, we are in Ireland, right? I have to speak about white <laughs> Even uh, in Sweden, we have a lot of research about Vikings and settlements and warriors, etc. But we are discovering new things all the time. These are the latest news, just a couple of weeks ago. From the city of Birka, that's the, one of the largest Viking cities in Sweden. It was a huge city, close to Stockholm, actually. And in this city, they have found 3,000 burial moons, a lot of graves to dig through. And one of the large, largest graves is this one. A really rich Viking warrior grave with a lot of things in it and even two animals. They reconstructed it and there were two horses in the grave, a lot of weapons, gaming pieces, a very rich grave. For a, obviously a very famous, at that time, warrior Viking. But when they finally got around to test his DNA, it turned out he was a woman. He was a female warrior. That was a 
a surprise because this was a really a rich warrior grade. And uh, depending on your US T2B, you might be a descendant of her. So this also shows that mitochondrial DNA is showing us new things about history. And this is just going to continue. The more people that test, the more we are going to learn about our history and the more skeletons they test. So it's, there are exciting times. I, if I come back next year, I suppose there are 80,000 tested in Sweden. Yeah. Maybe 15 million in the world. And by that, I say thank you. Thank you for a fabulous presentation and lots of food for thought. Now, any questions for Peter? Okay, we have one down here. Hoping this microphone survives. Peter, two men. You showed two men who were separated by about 12 generations. Um, were they exact matches of their paternal DNA, or did they have any extra mutations that had appeared in 12 generations? I've seen a lot of. DNA and I never understand how often the extra mutations appear. Yeah. A question, uh, I barely heard it, I think I heard it, uh, was were those two men exact matches? And it's it's quite tricky to understand what is an exact match anyway. How often does mutations occur in mitochondrial DNA? Those two are exact matches. But uh, mitochondrial DNA mutates very slowly. So, in, in a, on average, mutation occurs every 2,000 years. But we have families that two sisters have a distance of two. So it can happen very fast also, but it's all up to random. But closest matches, at, uh, zero distance matches, could be as far away as 1,000 years. There's a question uh, then here in the back and then Debbie at the front. Sorry about this microphone. I heard that the mitochondrial DNA and the white DNA just today. But on the mitochondrial DNA, should I have got my sister to do it or would I have better results for that? Uh, when it comes to mitochondrial DNA, you have the exact same as your sister. You have the same mother. So, yes. so it's no better or no worse to use your sister. Thank you. And a question from Debbie. What is the question? Just a comment. Uh, uh, I have worked in the same experience. I used to do that. I was going to say, I had exactly the same experience finding a, an ancient DNA sequence. There's a new paper that was coming out that Dan Bradley was talking about, that this massive migration that continues from the step in, into Western Europe, into the British Isles. And in that paper, there are mitochondrial DNA sequences. One of those sequences in the Netherlands is um, one step is matched with my dad, who is in his ancestry in London. And that was it, was just so exciting to actually see that in the in ancient DNA record. And that is, is a direct female line relative. That's really a, it's a close prehistoric relative, yeah? It's fascinating. Also, my, my oldest uh, relative to my Conradin A, she's several thousand years ago. My colleague Christina here, she was worse. You have four in Syria for 8,000 years ago? So she has the record right now. Question here, let's. I'll bring it uh, down to Jim and then we can bring it back to Peter. What is the best way to access these ancient DNA samples? Where do you get them to be able to compare? Yeah, you, you don't want to, to sift all through those uh, research papers. So you can go to the website Ancestral Journeys. It's a British historian, I think it is. Yeah, Jean Manko. She collects all those results from all those papers and puts them on ancestraljourneys.com, I think. Oh yeah, yeah, they also have an interactive map. Uh, that's... Oops. This one. So you can, you can uh, sort it by period, etc. 
Any other questions for Peter? Um, question back here. Uh, Eli, let's go back here and uh, get this question. Family tree DNA must have the largest collection of empty DNA. Uh, are they actively working to build the tree? Because the, the one that I see everybody refer to is the followtree.org, which is not from family tree. So who's, who's actually active in building the tree? Here we go. Well, that's really the huge bottleneck in this. It's one man in Netherlands. <laughs> who has taken on the, the uh, task of building this huge tree. <clears throat> and therefore, it's, there's a new version about every second year. And that's the phylo tree. It's, uh, it's a pity that family tree DNA isn't more active. Um, in, in I mean, obviously, in, in uh, Sweden, you've got wonderful records that go back to the 1500s. Here in, in Ireland, we're stuck at around about 1800. So what would your advice for the use of mitochondrial DNA for those people researching their Irish family trees? What would your advice be? My advice would be, go back as far as you can to the 1800s uh, and find that woman. And then you hopefully find two daughters. And then you go up until recent times and test people. So you get all those maternal lines tested and verified. When you have that accessible for everyone, then you can also find close branches and you're starting to map it before the, um, the time of the records. So be active, search line and test people. And uh, one of the fascinating things that you've done of course is um, trace the mother of Dal Dalakaria, is that how you pronounce it? Dalakaria. Dalakaria. Um, I'm just wondering, um, which famous Irish woman would we want to uh, trace all the descendants of? Anybody have any particular ideas? Queen Maeve, so Grace O'Malley, um, and who else? What other Irish women would we like to trace the descendants of? Grace O'Malley, well, Grace O'Malley got married to a Flaherty, and then she also got married to somebody else. Do you know the actual story of it? She actually had two husbands, and I'm sure she had uh, children, but I'm not sure if she actually had any daughters and whether they would actually have been documented. And I think that's one of the big problems, is we don't have that line of documentation all the way down from Grace O'Malley to at least one living descendant. And you do need to have that paper trail all the way back, all the way back. And I think in the annals, of course, they're very, very male biased, so you don't actually get the women being recorded. So if we do want to trace a famous Irish person, it'll have to be somebody probably since 1800. So. And we probably have uh, records for those people as well. But uh, yeah, we've got two common stem here. At the time of Brian Baru, one of the O'Carrolls from Kilkenny married his daughter to one of the Viking chieftains. And she, I believe, is mentioned in the Icelandic sagas. So uh, I've been trying to get, get uh, some readable in English uh, and short history of that so that I can trace it. But Carpo Carl, Austria or Eli, Austria. That would be certainly a feasible example that we could potentially um, get down. John, can you come out here? I'm just scared of that speaker behind you. I don't know a lot about mitochondria DNA, but it seems to me as we go down this, this journey of having more branches, like you were saying, and we do discover through science and forensic archaeology these ancient mitochondrial lines. Won't that fill in the gap to some of these things that we don't have paper records for? As far as seeing that this person historically was in a grave site related to a, somebody historically on the male side, it may help us over time? Or is, am I just wishing? Very good question. Peter, what do you think? Well, today they're mostly testing, analyzing uh, Neolithic and the Bronze Age people, Iron Age people. That's not that relevant for genealogy. But when they are starting to advance into medieval people, medieval graves, it will start to get interesting. Then we can fill in the gaps. 
And in terms of the test that we should be doing, is it just the basic mitochondrial test or should we do the full mitochondrial sequence? Good question. Uh, there are actually three tests you can take. You can test at 23 and me. Uh, how many have tested at 23 and me? A couple of you. Uh, then you get your mitochondria in a happy group, but on a very basic level because they have data from 2009 or 10 maybe, but it's seven years old. And you know how the tree is evolving. So that's not all much use. At family tree DNA, they have two types of tests. Uh, mitochondria DNA plus, I think they call it. But that's really a minus, don't use it. It's of no use at all. You can maybe find relatives 20,000 years ago. It's the mitochondria DNA full sequence. That's the only test on the market that gives you the whole mitochondria and makes it possible to upload to GenBank also. And that is on sale actually at the Family Tree DNA stand for $169. Um, I'm not sure what the euro equivalent of that is, um, but normally it's $199, so you're saving $30 if you buy it here today. Great. Well, listen, thank you, Peter, for a fabulous talk and for really kind of spurring our imagination. So um, let's go out there and be creative. Ladies and gentlemen, Peter Schultz.